and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us from the collective known as Samurai Sheepdog and the creator of the Lands of Thea campaign setting for both Pathfinder 1st and 2nd edition and D&D 5th edition, the one and only Stephen Rashid James. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. It's, it's good to be here. It's good, good, to have, good to have you in the temple, especially as the weather is starting to get more... starting to get more... Um, Agreeable for my, for my taste, i.e., summer is over. Good riddance. Thank goodness. Uh, everybody looks. Everybody, everybody <laughs> always looks at me like I'm crazy when I when I say I prefer I prefer winter. But when it's cold, when it's especially especially given how nasty the winters can get can get in the Midwest. But when it but when it gets cold, you can always put on more layers. Mm-hmm. I honestly prefer fall myself, but honestly, I, t- I take uh, winter over summer as well. Summer's just miserable. Oh, that, and you got to deal with the damn Skeeters. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> also, known, also known as the other state bird. <laughs> Plus some. Um, hey, I-, I didn't get to ask you, uh, how do you feel about like cussing on the show, as long as it's not too crazy, or should I keep that low? One of our mantras is the seven dirty words you can't say on, t- on TV. Shit, piss, fuck, cop, motherfucker, and tits. So, oh, no. I wasn't going to go that far. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, and um, some, of my co- some of the people I've had on have, have um, very military humor. Mm-hmm. And there's no, way, there's no way I'm going to get them to not curse when the situation calls for it. So I don't. So I don't try and swim up river. I feel you. I feel you on that. Now, nah, essentially, I was going to say winter and fall is when uh, it's the magical time of year when the mosquitoes and bugs go back to hell where they belong. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> is you. You went through all of that in the end, and hell was the one you were worried about. Yeah, yeah. You got to be careful nowadays when you're on like podcasts and whatnot. You don't want to insult anyone. You know how it is. You might be, well, um, that might, that might be the case with, that might be the case with, with some podcasts, not this one. (laughs) (laughs) This is, this is the, we call it the open bar of the internet for a reason. And, (laughs) and that is because the only, the only rule, the only, the only rules is that, is that there's, is that as long as. So so long so long as we're not saying something that's gonna get it that's gonna get us kicked off the platform, um, everything else goes. That's really good to know. <laughs> and given given some of the podcasters that served as inspiration for me, it'd be hypocritical for me to curtail um, language. I feel you on that. Um, <laughs> especially since especially since one of the <laughs> a few, a few of them were were notorious for some for some of their for some of their outbursts. Um, a few of them being a few of them being some local legends in my in my state. Um, and I've always and I've always I've always had a soft spot for the for roast style comedy. And yeah. just to, to see, it. plus, um. I've been I've been in some barber shops where they where they where um the bar, the barbs and the bands can get can get real cutting if you if you if you're not careful. Oh, most definitely, <laughs> most definitely. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'll say that I'll say that I'm blacker than I look, and and that's the place I usually have to go to get a haircut. So I am so <laughs> some. Some stuff get some stuff gets flown in the in those, especially since, well, one one of the one of the people who I usually go, usually go with to get a haircut, he has the 
he has the misfortune of being a Bears fan, and I do not and I do not let I do not let that go. <laughs> oh. Um <laughs> plus This is gonna be fun. This is gonna be fun, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Plus there was another one who had a who had a Yankees cap and I'm like, so how's it how's it like go how's it like going to the playoffs and never and never getting anything in ten years? You sound like um you sound like how I am with my dad. Like I don't even. I'm gonna be real with you. I don't even watch football like that. Mm-hmm. But I love. I love going into the house and just making fun of his team for no one reason. Well, we we do not believe in discrimination. We pick on everybody. <laughs> even even my even my own team even my own team is no is um <laughs> is no um is no exception. But because of the fact that I'm in it. I'm in a place that ha- that tends to have teams that are massive disappointments every year. Um, whenever I have to talk about my own teams, it's always a case of, "Hello there, reasons why I drink." I see we have some newcomers, <laughs> but and the, now, gr- granted, the, granted, there are some there are some teams where I I will I will pick on more I will pick on more than others. Um, oh. I, 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 the only, the only person, the only person who picks on the Cowboys more than me is Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> and well, when it comes to hockey, I have been, I have been spending the last, the last 20 or so years picking on the Leafs. Largely for the I'm same gonna, reason. I'm going to be honest with you. I, other than football, I don't really know that much about sports. I, I, I don't know. It's uh, it's not something that I ever really got into. Like, I love playing sports. Don't get me wrong. I love going out and playing sports, like in the backyards or whatever, with my boys. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to watching them, it's just something I can never get into. Um, I did a bit. I did a bit of amateur hockey, and I was basically basically the goon because I was the tall because I was the tallest guy there. Um, yeah. so. The coach would always say, "Hey, monk, you see that guy with the puck?" Yes, I do, sir. I don't want to fix that. Okay. <laughs> and well, yep. Yeah, well, you know how bull rushes work. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what's what's that like being tall? I'm going to be honest with you. I never, <laughs> I never felt short because, I, like, I'm average height. You know, like five ten, whatever, oh. what have you. I, I'm not tall, but I'm not short. And I never felt short until I came to this uh, new state that I live in now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I swear to you, I was walking around the compass, the college campus. These dudes, they, I, I, I mistook them for trees at first. Then I saw they were wearing <laughs> shorts. I was like, "What are they feeding y'all?" <laughs> um, I'm six six. And- Jesus. If I had a, if I had a dollar for if I had a dollar for every time somebody said I should I should be playing basketball, um, I'd ha- I'd have enough money to move to move further north where I wouldn't have to deal with warm weather. I, uh, you know, I I literally saw one of these guys. He was walking by the bleachers, and his girlfriend was on the top of the bleachers, and she's like, "Yo." I left my soda down there. This man bends over, picks up the soda, and then I don't even think he jumps. Uh, like I didn't see his knees bend. He just takes off like a like a spaceship. He's just up there, like face to face with her hands or the soda, and falls back down. I'm like, what did I just see? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds about right. Um, <laughs> the downside with being tall is one: anytime I'm on an airline. And two, anytime I have to get clothes because I have to go to a specialty shop. Oh, uh, that sucks. Because, especially, especially shoes, because I'm a, I'm a 15 wide. Most stores stop at 13, and I don't like getting them online. Yeah, because I bet you uh, shopping for shoes online, since you can't try them on, that's a hassle. I bet you you've had many situations where the shoes get there and they still don't fit right. Yeah, especially especially since um, there's been there's been a few places where where some store doesn't doesn't say whether they're using U.S. or U.K. sizes. Oh, jeez. And 
a 15 in UK is not the same thing as a 15 in US. And then it has to go prof- through the... Where's the professionalism, you know what I mean? Then I have to then I have to go through all the hassle of sh- of shipping it back out and he- and and heading to the heading to the post office and dealing with post office hours and all the other bullshit that happens to when when you're in a post office or you or a UPS store or anything like that. The whole time you're still waiting for new shoes. Mm-hmm. Yo, but, man. Of course, the 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 other. Th- there, I have had a few incidents um, where I was mo- I was helping somebody move, and I hit, and the back of my head hit an exit sign in the hallway, broke the <laughs> thing off. Ah, oh, jeez, I would have just left. <laughs> um, I see nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> well, everybody knows when there's one of those exit sign incidents because everybody could hear me cursing. <laughs> but. Of course, of course, um, there, of course, everybody expects you to grab something off, grab something off the top shelf. Although these yeah, days, that- I these days I tend to fuck with people with it because they'll come up to me and say, "Hey, could you get could you get this thing off the top shelf for me?" And I say, "Yeah," and I or rather, could you get this thing off the top shelf? And then I say, "Yes," and then I continue working. You know what? I just uh, watched. Something about that. Are you familiar with uh, Andrew Beerzak, the lead singer of Black Veil Brides? A bit. Um, he was telling a story on, I don't know if it was like a podcast or a video of some kind. He was telling a story about how he's tall, but not too tall. So he was walking around in the grocery store and a whole bunch of people, just like you said, were asking him to pick up things from the top shelf. Mm-hmm. So that's what he was doing. But then he said, and then a real tall guy came over, like a guy that was like 6'6". Like he said, a, a person that's really tall, he came mm-hmm. over to him and said, what are you doing? <laughs> he, said, he said he questioned his whole life. Like, is this my purpose to reach things on the top shelf? <laughs> yeah. But I, um, but I've, of course, of course, the, of course, you can probably figure out what, what that person's big mistake was because, because you probably figured out why, why I didn't um, grab the thing off the top shelf. They didn't oh, ask. Did you, <laughs> did you grab? Uh, oh, did you grab something off the top shelf and then just walk away, or did you grab it or grab the wrong thing because they didn't specify? No, I no, I just didn't do it. They said they asked if I. They said they said, "Can you get something off the top shelf?" And they and I said, "Yes." They didn't. And then ask. you walked away. <laughs> they did. They didn't. They didn't ask. They didn't ask me to do it. You That's, said, "I don't know." You said, "Can I?" <laughs> no, I, I didn't say that. I just said, "I just said yes," and wa- and walked off. Yeah. <laughs> because they didn't ask me. Damn, damn, if, damn. <laughs> but i I'd like to I'd like to delve into a bit of the humble beginnings. Um, how'd you how did you first walk me? How you first got into um, RPGs and how and how it stuck. You mean like uh, as a hobby when I was a kid? Yeah, I like to open everybody. Everybody who was a designer was a hobbyist first. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. With me, uh, I was nine and my dad, we still had the PlayStation 1. Mm-hmm. He had bought this game. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Final Fantasy Tactics, the original one. Oh, I am. I am familiar. <laughs> for, yeah. for what it's for what it's worth. um I know that my shtick is I've about how I've seen some shit, but um, there is I have heard so I've heard so many origin stories in one form or another that th- that um, it's impossible to surprise me me at this point. And with F- with FF Tactics, well, for, first off, I'll give um, I'll give your old I'll give your old man props. Second off, I have to wonder if you abused the item duplication glitch that everybody did. Uh, I didn't do no glitches. This was all natural for me. Mm-hmm. But um, when I was playing it, uh, I, I like I really like it. I became obsessed with it. And then, like as fate would have it, I started going to middle school, and the other kids in middle school were reading Dungeons and Dragons books. So I said, "Hey, can I see that? That looks like fun." I open a book, read it for five seconds, close it, and be like, "This is Final Fantasy Tactics." 
And they're like, what? I said, this is the same game. <laughs> you make a character, you get two things to do every round. Mo- usually it's move and attack or move and cast a spell or something like that. And then your turn is over and the other people move their units. This is multiplayer Final Fantasy Tactics. And then I became obsessed with that. So it just evolved from that. You want to know so really, what you want to know what's so funny about that to me? What? <laughs> I what? there is a there is a sub, there is a sub I have been picking on the grognards in tabletop for years. And some of them get really pissed off about the notion about the notion, the sheer brass balls of putting video game concepts into tabletop RPGs. They're Said literally- people do not know their history. Exactly. Exactly. They, they're they so alike. And I'm going to be honest with you. Um, to me, playing Dungeons & Dragons was like playing video games, but I didn't need electricity to do it. Well, there's also the fact that TSR had even get, it was even an early pioneer when it came to computer RPGs with the SSI um, series of games. So... And and if I want to go even further back, there was a D and D adaptation on the old Plato servers in the seventies. Uh, no, you're going too far back for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit I'm a bit of a historian, and I I ended up going down a rabbit hole when when extra credits tried to claim that JRPGs descended from visual novels, which oh. um you don't need to be a historian to know that that's bullshit. Yeah, I was about to say. I feel like that's not right. It that's because it isn't because both because both Square and Annex were making um, were making both visual novels and vi- and um, video games and um, RPG video games in the same year. Um, yeah, obviously, obviously, some of them for the PC ninety eight because um, PC engine systems were far more popular in Europe and Japan than they were in the states and. The origin, the the or the origin of um, of the JRPG, as a lot of people know it, comes down to wizardry and how popular that got in Japan. Yeah, and wizardry was using some of AD and D's rule set, although because of the lack of a map, you're not going to see me play the original wizardry anytime soon. And yeah, people talk people talk about how about how weird some JRPGs are. As as if um, as if WRPGs and I hate both of those terms were any were any less weird. You just just look at some of the just look at some of the insanity that would go down in the Might and Magic games. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know what? I hear you with that. Uh because so I think a lot of people look at look at Might and Magic and think that it would be standard European fantasy, and it is, but it's a trap. Because it doesn't take long before before you start introducing a- aliens, alien civilizations, and fucking laser rifles. Oh, you know what that reminds me of? There was an there was an old game. Hold on, I think it was called something like Fantasy Star or something like that. Yeah, it reminded me of that. Yeah, and the re- the reason why a lot of why a lot of early um, JRPGs is, as they're known. Had that first had that first person perspective comes down to wizardry. That's the reason why you see that in stuff like Dragon Quest and um, Fantasy Star. Um, because of, it's always fascinating seeing the seeing the evolutionary chain when it comes to when it comes to designs. Yeah. Oh, that's part of the reason why why I like to folk why I like to hear about the humble origins and, and see how that kind of has a ripple effect with everything afterwards. Cause what now with lands of Thea, was that, was that like a homebrew campaign that you, this, did that sort of as like a homebrew campaign that you just expanded with time? Yes. What happened was, so ever since I was nine, I was the DM because nobody else wanted to be the DM. You know how it is. 
Yeah, I know. Forever DMs. <laughs> <laughs> so I created a lot of stories and a lot of adventures, and I started noticing that my players wanted to continue in certain adventures. Like, they'd play in one land, they'd defeat that adventure, but then they'd be like, yo, what happens after we beat the bad guy? Like, can we continue? Can, can we play there again? Or, like, I'd start an adventure, and I'd be like... All right, so there's a dragon in the distance, and they're like, oh, I bet you we're in that dragon-infested land again, aren't we? And I'm like, you are now. Hold on. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I found out that people really liked the, the things that I made, so I wrote them down. And then one day, I'm an adult. Uh, I'm trying to remember how old I was. I must have been, I must have been like 27 or something, maybe 28. Mm -hmm. And um, me and my wife were sitting there, and we were cleaning. And she notices like a whole bunch of like composition notebooks and things of this nature. And she says, what's this? And I said, oh, that's my old Dungeons and Dragons notes. I should probably look at those and like maybe set up a campaign. And she said, you know, you're an adult now and you can make money off of these. And I looked at her and I said, what? <laughs> so that's yeah. how that started. That That's literally how that started. I talked to... um. Lens of Thea is a collection of all of the different campaigns I used to run and all of the different lands that those encompass. Um, what I did was I put certain countries beside other countries that made sense and turned those scattered adventures into one big world. Mm -hmm. And that's what that is. Yeah. And... Well, I will st I will state for the record that you are in good you are in good company because that's not too far removed from how um, from how Blackmoor, one of the earliest campaign settings, was created. Um, just a just a collection of ideas that just morphed into into that. Yeah. Um, largely be lar largely coming out of the war out of the college um, war gaming scene that was really popular back in the day. <laughs> um, because, but now, some now, do you can what sort of fantasy do you consider Lands of Thea? Since fantasy is not a one is obviously not a one size fits all. Do you tend to lean more towards high? Do you go more epic, heroic? I doubt. I with some of the names I saw in there, I doubt you're going into into low fantasy. Oh, no, no, no. It's um, there's, it's definitely not low fantasy. So what it is, is each one of the different countries in Lands of Thea encompasses a different campaign that we played when I was a kid. Um, they each have their own themes and things of this nature, and they all kind of work together. So when it comes to what kind of fantasy it is, um, it just depends on where you are on Thea at any given time. Like, take, for example, if you're in um, one of the jungle countries like Jehufa Allah, essentially, it's kind of like, uh, you know, jungle exploration, maybe a few dinosaurs, land of the lost kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. With with that, I guess it would be, you know, medium fantasy, things of this nature. But mm -hmm. then there's also places like uh, Fafutan or places like uh, Persimum, where it's essentially, these are kingdoms that are built um, with magic in mind. Their, their communities use magic for everyday things. So things like, uh, you know, uh, famine, sickness, um, weather, like natural disasters, they don't really feel, fear these things. So in places like that, it's high fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's... Um, Thea is very much encompassed around where you uh, where you as a dungeon master or where you as a game master wants your wants your adventure to take place. You have a whole bunch of different options as to where to do that. Mm hmm. And with and with that, which I do appre I do appreciate that because and ish there's an issue that I've had with how. A lot, how a lot of people see how a lot of people see fantasy. It's they see it's a very it's a very limited view. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of folks seem to have this idea of fantasy being what I call the Tolkien melting pot, and I don't have anything against against the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, obviously, 
Yeah. But I don't like but I don't like I even resent the idea of that of that um of that pastiche of the of British Isles and sometimes um west sometimes Western Europe, especially France. Oh. As the as the way you're as the way you're supposed to do fantasy. Exactly. Fantasy oh. encompasses so many different cultures and ideals. It's I, I find it odd that a lot of people try to limit their their games. You know what I mean? Well, and this is not this is not a new thing because I remember I remember being on forums when I when I was playing um, Planescape Torment, and some people saying saying that it should be considered science fiction because it's too weird to be fantasy. Which, yeah. um, which I which it's on, it is only that weird when you when you have that assumption of of a default, um. Which would which would kind of would which would be the equivalent of saying that John Carter is too is too is too weird to be consi- to be considered science fiction, or that or that it doesn't have enough science in the idea of science fiction. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Mm-hmm. And for me, for me personally, I've I've always I do like. Whenever I've t- I tr- I tackle a variety of, of fantasy styles, but I've gone on record as saying one of my favorite RPGs is Legend of the Five Rings, which is vi- which is best described as as samurai drama. I love Legend of the Five Rings. Oh my god, dude! Um, I like I like it. I like most of it, except for anybody who unironically plays lion. I don't like the lions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Then, like then, playing, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Then again, um, some people think I'm weird because I, because I prefer picking um, scorpions. I, I like playing the lesser known ones, like mantis or uh, what. Like I like being like a survivor from the boar, things like that. Would you, if you're talking about lesser known, would you end up going with the um, Kieran or the unicorn? Hmm. Those are good choices, but I feel like even lesser known, like the fox or the snake. Ah, I can like the, I, lo, like the ones that don't have special pictures. The <laughs> the the, the uh, my, well, the great thing about the the way minor clans are set up is that you can make just about any minor clan and still make it work. Yeah. Oh, uh, but I can I can certainly I can certainly see that. Oh. Uh, but I, but whenever whenever there's the t- whenever there's the talk about how you about um about use about um tr- about trying to trying to house trying to home, homebrew or house rule um the co- the core rules into that kind of setting um the thing I often bring up is the most common way to equip a fighter is sword and board. Long sword or sometimes bastard sword and a large shield. Yep. How are you going to do that when you're dealing with a culture where shields aren't a thing? Exactly. And that's not even getting into some of the some of the some of the weird ass weapons you might see in 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 places like it places like India or the or the um or or the or the islands on the southern on the southern end of the of the Pacific. Okay. Um, one of my favorites being the Tayaha because it's basically a short spear and a club all in one. I I really love I really love how you're uh referencing different cultures and their weapons and their ways of like having fantasy because I really one of the fun things for me in Lands of Thea was the weapon section. Mm-hmm. Where I got to like come up with new weapons, but really I didn't come up with much. I just uh, looked at weapons that you know Pathfinder had not taken a gander at, and there are so many. There are so many good and cool ones. I was like, oh well, this is. Um, I couldn't believe they had never. Are you familiar with uh, Soul Caliber? Yeah, uh- I know that. <laughs> especially, <laughs> Every- especially, tr- especially trolling as Raphael. <laughs> yep. 
Everyone that's played Soul Calibur knows who Tira is. They didn't even have her giant circle blade in there. Um, and I was like, I was yeah. like, oh, I gotta make that. Yeah, those. W- that would be that would be. A, I was I was gonna make a shock a shock room comparison, but it's but it's way too big for that. Um, yeah, even even something that you'd think would be obvious, like like um, Tonfas are, aren't really in there. Um, yeah, and. We- and weapons that weapons that are in- weapons that are in there, I feel like I feel like they they aren't a- they aren't able to shine the way they should because um one of my main one of my go to guys in Soul Calibur is Keelik. Yep. And I'm not yep. I'm not just saying that because because monk aesthetic, <laughs> but <laughs> you look you look at the fantasy of the, of that martial artist who's a master of using a quarter staff, and then you look at how the quarter staff is portrayed in a lot of um, role playing games, and the and the fantasy isn't able to come across. Yeah. Yeah, one hundred percent. You have to you have to go above and beyond to like mm-hmm. make your quarter staff really shine. You know, and, I'm talking masterwork, magic weapon, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and um, that's not that's not even getting into like the um that's not even getting to some some of the some of the more out there stuff like a maha like a and I'm I'm really gonna fuck up the pronunciation of this uh, maha huitil. Oh, what is that? That is a that is a club that was used that was used by Aztecs. It is it is a it is a wooden club with obsid with obsidian um obsid obsidian shards on the edge. Oh, I know that thing. Mm-hmm. That is such a cool weapon, yo. Yeah, I mean there, there's there's that there's the. There's the um, even when it comes, even when it comes to even when it comes to swords, there's I d- I um, there are some there are some people who will ar- there are some people who will argue until they're blue in the face that a claymore and a zweihander should not be statted the same way. Yeah, and I've got I've got friends who are in the who are in the SCA. So so that so they can they can vouch for that kind of thing. Um, there's a shitload of variety when it comes to the concept of halberds. Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, and it would be imagine imagine someone want, imagine someone is a is a fan of Final Fantasy VII. I'll use that as an example. They really they really like the Buster Sword, and. When they when they want to be a, they want to be a fighter and you and utilize that to fulfill the fantasy of being a cloud XP or be, or a soldier XP, yeah. And yet, if you were to go with the base rules, the Buster Sword would just be a great sword. It's a little bit that, underwhelming. Real talk. That's why I really love um, out of out of all the different editions and mm-hmm. the different games. I have a special p- uh, place in my heart for Pathfinder One E. Because um, I've been with it so long that in D and D three point five, which I mean, let's not kid ourselves here, is the same game with like slight. You know what I'm saying? Um, not too long ago, I did a I did a episode of, of my of the of the podcast, The Adventures of the Monk and the Monarch, with my good buddy Mad Monarch. We ended huh. up we ended up doing a um, we ended up going through most of the core Pathfinder classes. Aside from the ones from Occult Adventures, because he isn't as familiar with them as I am, and yeah. ra- and ranking them, not ranking them on o- on overall power, but overall utility. Yeah. So obviously, um, cl- obviously stuff like cleric and druid got at, got at the top of the list, um, but there are some that were that weren't as high in the, but there's some that weren't as high in the list that we re- that we still we still like say like say um Magus. And alchemist and um, monarch is a big fan of inquisitors. Yeah. Uh, Investigator for me all the way. Um, we had we had a bit we had a bit of back and forth when it came to the vigilante class because he doesn't think it fits in in a in a fantasy setting like Pathfinder. I I disagree. Um, 
I think I think the issue is a lot a lot of people look at it as just superhero. What you really should be looking at it as is less less su- less Superman or the or the Flash and more Doc Savage or the Phantom or the Shadow or even Zorro. You know those those old those golden age pulp heroes. Yeah, you know what? I wish so there's a there's a uh an adventure path um Pathfinder did called War for the Crown. And in there, I, I don't know her name, but there is this vigilante that is so well done. And I think she encompasses it perfectly. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I do think the class is can easily be used in a fantasy setting. But when you say I'm a vigilante, people's minds go straight to Batman, just like you said, like superheroes and whatnot. If and I have not- to use a more contemporary example, Casey Jones. Yeah, that's a good example. Because no, no trick, no tricks. Just, just somebody who's just somebody who's wiry and ha- and has a whole lot of sporting equipment. You know what? Um, I hate to constantly make references to video games, especially since the listeners might not have played those games. Oh, believe um, me, they've played. You've got nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, uh, Tales of Vesperia. Mm-hmm. You, are you familiar with that one? Yes. Uh, Raven, I could see him being a vigilante. Pretty, pretty much, and of of course, anybody who's familiar with with that style of fantasy is going to be familiar with one with at least one of the legends of, say, Robin Hood, or if we want to go a little bit weeb, um, the Master Thief Goemon. Yep, exactly. Both could be both could be spectacular vigilantes, and. Of course, of course, there's our there's our scene Lupin. That one I'm not too familiar with. I'm not gonna lie. No. <laughs> you might be familiar with his with his descendant Lupin the Third. Oh snap! I know them. <laughs> but our scene Lupin was was a was a was kind of the poster child for the Phantom Thief archetype, and. There, and it was it was um it it came, it came from France which is pro- which because of the fact that a lot of the a lot of the original stories weren't translated for quite a while is the I think is the reason why a lot of people weren't as familiar there was wow. one crossover with Sherlock Holmes but Arthur Conan Doyle considers that crossover um not ca- not canon he he wasn't, yeah. it wasn't even given it wasn't he wasn't even he didn't even give permission for it <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but nothing, nothing you could do about it because it because it because well, lang- language barrier for one and country barriers for another. Yeah. Um, but when, but given, and that, and but given given that, it's that's the reason why I appreciate the ver- the variety of of angles that can be done. With, yeah. with this particular um, this particular setup, and I, I would like to I would like to go into a bit of the races and classes, and just get just get a feel for the, the fantasy that they're that they're meant to that they're meant to embody, especially when it comes to the classes. Of course. Um, I'm I'm gonna go f- I'm gonna go from top to bottom, and obviously some of the classes some of the races are going to be familiar to anybody who's tangentially familiar with fantasy. Yeah. But I'd be curious with those how how they're how they're expressed in this setting, and of course. I'll, I will start with the Cabaro. All right. Uh, did you just want me to explain about them, or? Yeah, a bit a bit of a skinny and and what and what they bring to and the kind of theme the kind of theme that they bring to the table. Oh sure. sure. Um. The Kabaro are like well, first of all, they're an owl folk race. Um, they just have gone through like this great catastrophe where most of their population was wiped out, and they had to step away from adventuring so that their uh, culture can heal. Uh, after like a long time, now in the lands of Thea timeline, they're finally able to adventure again. Um, I created them because I wanted. And I know this is going to sound a little silly, but I wanted like a short magical race that wasn't humanoid. I always liked the gnomes, 
but I wanted like something that didn't look too human like. And the Kabaro fit that bill perfectly. Not only that, but since they're owls, I was able to really bend into uh, the uh, uh, Latino culture as well when it comes to um, their background, their style of clothing, things to this nature. They looked really good like that. So it was a very nice fit. There's a lot of stories about owls from that culture that works perfectly with them being a magical race. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Overall, I, I guess the slot that they fill in a typical RPG element is... Uh, oh, that's a hard question, I guess. Well, so um, it's obviously when, when it comes to the slot that they fill, um, um, I'll ho hold off on that until we get to the classes because obviously with races, there's a whole lot of different directions you can go. You're right. You're right. And I was just about to go into classes too, so I'm glad you stopped me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, I, I really like them. I gave them a lot of interesting abilities. One of my favorite yeah. abilities being a swiveling head. It's mm -hmm. harder to flank them because their head can go in any direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've always had a thought of playing a Kabaro who is like a barbarian or a monk that goes headlong into combat with multiple enemies and they're like attacking him from every different direction, but he's like spinning around and fighting them evenly. Yeah. The Knights, from what from what I'm seeing, um, seem to be well do seem to be well dog folk. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, the Knights are actually from uh, the realm of dreams. Essentially what they are is they're, uh, well, for lack of a better term, they're good boys. <laughs> they're from the realm of dreams, and they mm -hmm. noticed that in Thea in particular, there were a lot of uh, nightmares, and the realm of dreams was in, under invasion by the nightmare realm over Thea. So they were like, what is going on down there? So they actually migrated from the realm of dreams to Thea's material plane to spread goodness and kindness and just make people make their lives better so that they won't have so many bad dreams that affect the realm of dreams and thus affect their home world. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, since they're from the realm of dreams, they don't have like a solid, uh, like a solid way of how should i put this they don't have just one particular way that the race looks they can look like any dog and they could be sizes from small size to large size so there could be like a large size bulldog canine a small size chihuahua canine um their fur can be different colors i think in the art i put in the book their eyes and their irises are rainbow colors they're very like psychedelic uh not of this world type of race mm-hmm um uh, the the um the two the images that I saw of them in the book um def definitely gave me a very a very um in a very india vibe yeah I, I i would definitely say that india was um india was a very big part of their inspiration because when i think of um when i think of like smoky hazy scenes when i think of like um dream states and things of this nature for some reason my mind always goes to uh the arabian nights um th like like hookah bars things of this mm -hmm. nature very very uh it, it's very it's a very mystical scene so oh, i i mm -hmm. yeah so oh, that too. definitely inspired me with that I'll have to I'll have to um I'll have to show you Black Void um sometime down the road. Oh, that sounds cool. Uh, <laughs> so with with the Deathless um obvious obviously they obviously they're well un, well undead. Yeah. The uh the Deathless the story behind them is um thea has had a lot of um issues with how it reacts with the other planes thus you know with the canines on the night railroad and things of this nature so in one country called zautan there's this emperor from like an from an ancient time maybe like uh thousands of years ago and he wanted to m make himself immortal so that he can ensure that his empire rules over like defeats his 
enemies and things of this nature. However, when he cast the spell, uh, he was tricked and he got the spell from an un, I guess, an unreputable source. And what it did was it made him immortal, but it turned him into a vampire. And then it changed half of his population of his empire into straight undead. Mm -hmm. Ever since, ever since that time, that spell he cast from way back when has starting to corrupt the magic around Thea. So when sometimes people are like, oh, Billy died, it's okay, I'll cast a spell and revive him. I'm going to use Raise Dead on Billy. And then Billy comes back, but his neck is still broken. And they're like, what? And it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's these, these beings that come back still with the physical scars of, you know, what happened to them that caused them to die are known as the deathless. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they, they're like forever changed by the trauma of dying and then being ripped back to life, but in a body that was not meant to be back to life. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why, but just especially with the art that 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 you show with them, um, especially with that knight, I keep get I keep getting reminded of the medieval um, series. You know what? I I, I didn't. Uh, that wasn't an inspiration, but I see what you mean there. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely oh. see what you mean there. Okay, I can I can. I can see I can see a fair few people playing it playing a deathless and having a very British humor ap approach to the fact that they're not to to them being to quote the princess bride mostly dead. I can see that like black black knight kind of jokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean the first Harry Potter book had the gag of, had the gag of a ghostly named nearly headless Nick. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, the Deathless also, since there's somewhere between life and death, you can get specific racial features mm -hmm. um, for them that bring them closer to undeath as well. Like take, yeah. for example, let's say you're a Deathless and, you know, for all the purposes, you, you'd say, oh, I was burned at the stake. So when I was brought back as a Deathless, I was just a charred skeleton. Mm -hmm. There are racial traits for that that'll give you, like, the resistances of a skeleton because, guess what, you don't have any organs or things of this nature, so, of course, it's going to be different. Um, mm -hmm. I I really like that, too. I like that about him. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the dwarves? The dwarves, um, so in Lands of Thea, I always thought it was weird. Actually, in Pathfinder and in Dungeons and & Dragons, I always thought it was weird that they only had the half elves and the half orcs, and then they stopped there. I was like, I feel like there would be more races, and I think later on they made um, something that was like, you know, you could fuse two halves of two races together in any capacity. I think they did that. I'm not sure if it was fifth edition or um, in there this was new world. Pathfinder, both Pathfinder and third edition have their own have their own builder race options. Um, D and D fourth edition's run of Dark Sun had the Mole, which is a half human, half dwarf. Oh, um, but the early the earliest case I can think of of that of that idea of free forming it was Savage Species for three point five. I can't remember, I remember if it was three point oh three point oh or three point five, and I I think it was three point oh was Savage Species. Yeah, and like I said, Pathfinder had a point by racial system introduced. Exactly, exactly. Um, so the dwarves are what happens when an orc and a dwarf have a child. Mm -hmm. so, the, so they're a half-breed in that capacity. The way we did the dwarves was they are like they're very focused on loyalty and law, even more so than their dwarf parents. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they have a strong sense of wanting to prove themselves to their community and prove themselves useful to the collective of people that they care about. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have like uh, almost like gym-like eyes. Their eyes can be any color from blue to red to purple. But the thing is, when they're angry or passionate, their eyes glow and glisten like gemstones. Um, yeah, I gotcha. 
Uh, we made them like you know how like dwar- dwarves are supposed to be like tough like the stone, and orcs are supposed to be strong in other ways. We made them so that they are like, um, how should I put this? Like we made them as um, a race. You can play them; they're dang near indestructible. They have bonuses to, they can get bonuses to strength, constitution, HP. I'm talking about them a lot because I really like them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. But no, it's, uh, as a matter of fact, in the newest adventure, I had a lot of fun designing a, well, the adventure path. Um, I'll get into that later if we have the time, but Mm -hmm. essentially uh, one of the main characters in that path is a dwarf as well. And I really like bringing that culture to the table. Um, Something about always wanting to be useful to your society, always wanting to prove yourself as the best so that others look up to you as well. Um, Personally, I I, I do feel that, and I like that a lot as well Mm -hmm. with them. Yeah, I can I can get that. Um. So ne- obviously, ne- obviously, next would be the um, Gilan. I'm hoping I got that pronounced right. Yep, exactly. Um, with that, essentially, what it is is it's a type of lizard folk. Mm -hmm. Um, they're strongly based off of Gila monsters. I'm sure you know what those are. Oh, yeah. Um, I wanted them to be poisonous, but I also wanted them to be, like, skinny and lithe, almost, like, athletic when it came to it. I wanted Mm -hmm. them to be, uh, like, jungle lizard folks that blend into the, the foliage and things of this nature and strike with poison before disappearing back into the trees. So, so, so that's what I did with uh, with their design. I don't know if you can tell that from the pictures, but I wanted I, them to be. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I could, I, I certainly could. Um, and I, pre- I appreciate the spear with what with that you used for one of them. Thanks, thanks. Um, but no, um, I, I really like that. Uh, those people as well. Essentially, just think, uh, lizard folk. Less, mm-hmm. le- less, you know, strong, more fast, poisonous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the, kind, the kind of lizard folk that wouldn't be too far removed in South America. Exactly, exactly. Oh. Um, now, I, I saw that you have gnolls, and what I find interesting is a lot of times when gnolls show up, they tend to be a very violent um, race, but... With, but in your in your case, well, the first null representative you have is a is a merchant who want who is ve- who is very colorful. <laughs> oh man, I the gnolls are, and I, I hate to say this, the no, the gnolls are my baby. <laughs> I love <laughs> I love gnolls. I've always loved gnolls. My favorite animal is the hyena. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I really like gnolls. So whenever I play gnoll characters, a lot of times I. I I play them di- like you know like nicer and more friendly than regular gnolls. So in Lands of Thea, I created a narrative. What it was was the gnolls were mercenaries that would get you safe passage passage across the desert and the badlands. Um, but they were they were rude and they were very you know um, what's the word standoffish. Um, one day, uh, gnomes gnomes aren't native to Thea. So a portal opened up from the Feywild and gnomes fell out. They didn't know where they were. They didn't know, you know, anything about their environment and they were scared. So the gnolls um, took them to this next safest like area, really just to be rid of them. Mm -hmm. But when the when the gnomes got there, they were very thankful to the gnolls and they cast a spell on them as thanks, allowing the gnolls to it erased the gnoll's color blindness because gnolls were colorblind beforehand. When it did that, the gnolls were completely astounded by how beautiful the world was and how colorful everything was. So in Lands of Thea, gnolls are obsessed with art, with culture, with clothing, 
with any sort of representation that they can pull off to really show off their individuality and with different colors. They think that there are more colors that even they've been introduced to and they want to see them. Like mm-hmm. they, <laughs> um, I don't know if you've flipped that far in the book, but uh, there's a class called Zealot mm-hmm. and the uh, the iconic for that is a knoll. And he's got like dyed hair and random colored clothing. He it's I, I, I've wanted to reinvent them. And I really like what I've done with them. Yeah. Now, when it comes to half dwarves, it's kind of funny that that's in the list when I mentioned the mole in um, Dark Sun. But yeah. I I get a very steampunk vibe out of them. And I'm curious if that steampunk vibe is care is um is unique is unique to them or if it can be carried over into the um dwarves themselves we can um in lands of the uh, the dwarves um that you know they're of course they're a very underground race but because of an event called the collapse a lot of them like it was a worldwide earthquake a lot of them fled to the surface and on the surface the only thing that they were really familiar with was the sea because down underground, there are many seas down there as well. So they were already were able to sail on magnet ships. So mm-hmm. many dwarves, many dwarves on the surface are sailors. And since they use magnet ships, they can go to different places and learn more steampunk technology. So very much you can use steampunk technology with dwarves. It would fit in just perfectly with Lands of Thea. The half mm-hmm. dwarves are the children of when these sailor dwarves come to shore. And of course, they're docking in places that can help them fix up their steamships, and thus that's where the the steampunk setting was coming in. Mm-hmm. Now that now um that brings that the next one on the list was the um was the Caritas. Uh, the Karatas, just mm-hmm. like the Gilan, were based off of Gila monsters. The Karatas were based off of horned lizards. Yeah, I can um, definitely see it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted um, a lizard folk race that was more like, you know, lizard folks are strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gilan are fast. I wanted one that was tough, and that's where the Karatas came in. They have um, a lot of defenses. They have harder scales than other lizard folk. Um, they have, uh, they also have defensive capabilities as well, I do believe. And mm-hmm. essentially what they are is even though like all the different people in Thea have really like become a melting pot, the Karatas have kept their, um, original, um, their original culture highly intact because they're, they're very guarded. They don't like to let people in, mm-hmm. um, uh, not to say that they're like rude or whatever. They're very, um, how should I put it? I don't want to use the word xenophobic. They're very, um, they're guarded. just like, hey, yeah, guarded. They're like, hey, stranger, you've come to our lands. Oh, yeah, I came to see. So when can you leave, though? That's what I want to know. <laughs> so in, in other words, um, hippity hoppity, get off my property. Mm-hmm. Very much so. <laughs> um, in that regard, I'd probably compare them to the um, Torian Concordat, although the Torians have a from um, BattleTech, although those guys have a bit more reason to to have a to have a mild xenophobia. Since yeah, I'm not sure how familiar you are with BattleTech, but the Torian Concordat is a nation on the periphery. There's two major regions. There's the Inner Sphere, which is the more which is the more civilized. Um, Oh, na- nations with nations within space, and then you have the periphery, which tends to be akin to the outer rim in Star Wars, or or the um, or the bo- or some of the borderland kind of kind of planets in Firefly. It's basically yeah. the Wild West, where you have a whole lot of people who are staunchly staunchly independent, and would and don't ha- don't have some fond romanticism of the of the inner sphere and in fact a lot of them don't tr- would 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 sooner would sooner shoot someone from the inner sphere just in just in case they were up to some shit because they can't be up to some shit if they're dead <laughs> and in- the torians are share a border with the with 
with one with one of the more infamous and one of the more treacherous intersphere nations, the the Capellan Confederation, to the point that when the Ares Convention to try and to try and um, make war less less like less a nuke fest was signed, the Torians refused because the, the Capellans were a signatory and they don't trust them. Yeah. Of course, shortly after that, the Capellans decide to invade to invade using nuclear weapons, saying, "Hey, these guys weren't a signatory, so it's so they're fair game." And they nearly bankrupted the. <laughs> the problem is with that is that the Torians take war very seriously. They, their mil, their um, their military attitude is is again hippity hoppity, get off my property, comma I have nuclear weapons. <laughs> You and, know what? The more the, the more you explain these guys, the more I'm like, yeah, that sounds like the Karata. <laughs> and the Capellans almost bankrupted the, almost bankrupted their country, and all they got out of it, out of out of years upon years of fighting, was three worlds. And as soon as that ha- as soon as that was done, the Torians dug dug in and prepared for the next fight. It, now, when it came when it came to just unifying them with the rest of the inner sphere, that war took twenty years. Jesus, the Jesus. <laughs> but, but the like that they 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 can they can be nice people, but it's a case of um fuck around and fuck around and the bull comes out. Yep, exactly. Fuck around and find out. <laughs> <laughs> but with. Now, when it comes to the Leoprines, which, def- which very, very, um, very much rabbits. Um, yeah. <laughs> what, what can you tell? What can you tell me about? What can you tell me about them aside from probably being sick of carrot jokes? <laughs> well, to be honest, um, I've heard so many people say their names differently. I've heard leperines. I particularly call them leaperines because I imagine them jumping and leaping, mm-hmm. but that's probably <laughs> it's up to whoever, however you want to say it. Um, yeah. The leaperines, what they are is they uh, are you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the kinders. Um, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're my take on them. Essentially what they are, are super friendly people where they'll move like a leaperine couple will move into your neighborhood and then before you know it, you have 20 of them. And then they're all like asking you questions when you're doing the most basic things. They're like, hey, are you mowing your lawn? What does your lawnmower run on? What kind of lawnmower is that? And it's like, hey, can you please stop? <laughs> they other races or the other people is that they uh, find them endearing, but can also find them annoying mm-hmm. because all, they want to learn about everything, but they do it in the most childish way. Mm-hmm. Um, Leaper, uh, of course, this kid, uh, when a Leaperine suffers tragedy, though, this can change them in a bad way, too. Like, uh, I know if you see on the art, you'll see one Leaperine that, uh, he's actually like a gladiator in pit fights. You see him with the knife? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he yeah. looks, he looks like a Pierce, he looks like a Pierce Six kind of guy. Yeah, exactly. When they... When they lose their family members or something, or when they're separated from other Leaperines based off of tragedy, they actually like sink into the survival instincts, and they can actually be pretty dangerous, uh, dangerous warriors. Think of Ram- think of Rambo, like mm-hmm. traps out of everywhere, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, now, orcs are no stranger to to fan- to fantasy settings, although. I'd say I'd say a lot of people either do the, will do them in one of two flavors: either the either the orcs as a villainous horde, or the, or they'll do orcs as a set as a semi villainous horde, a la Warcraft. Um, yeah. What approach What approach do you take with the orcs? For the orcs of Lands of Thea, what I did is they're just like any other peoples. They're uh they're just very large so with that comes you know the whole um i could take things that i want uh but at the same time that doesn't mean that, like they're not all jerks in lance of thea i think the orcs are large size they're like 12 feet tall something mm-hmm. like that um they lean more into the giants 
um, or like uh, ogres, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. However, essentially, what their what their culture is is it's very um, it's uh, tribal, but at the same time, very based on honor. And during the uh, uh, I'll get into. There's a certain event called uh, the Age of Fire, mm-hmm. where um, an evil force essentially takes over and enslaves all of the humanoids in Thea for a while. Um, during that time, the orcs actually found that they had a lot in common with the other races of Thea. And then during the event that freed all of the races from the um, from the Age of Fire, and a day known as Dragonfall. The mm-hmm. orcs fought so bravely and honorably that in current Thea, they're known as brave warriors and people give them respect when they see them. So mm-hmm. they have a very peaceful relationship with the other races. Yeah. Um, now, we, we, already, we already kind of went into the dwarves, so I can, so I can skip over that. Um, yeah. uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to elves... I know that our elves are different as a page on TV tropes, but I don't. But I'm curious. I'm curious the, as to the approach that you take with with um elves, because there are certain there are certainly certain um traps that can ha- that can happen with the way elves are portrayed and what give and what gives them their unfortunate reputation in some settings. Of course, of course. Um, in Lands of Thea, actually, all of the elves suffer from a disease. And this disease makes it so that if they stay in one spot for too long, their body will start to acclimate to that spot until they'll become like and like more and more until they become one with the environment. Like, say, for example, an elf that lives on, on the beach will they have their hair grow more flowy maybe their skin becomes more textured and they'll continue to have more and more things like maybe their eyes look like the sunset eventually if they stay there too long they'll die and then their body will essentially just become sand and seashells Mm -hmm. so because of this the elves and uh thea are constantly migrating there are people that don't really have a set land and they go from place to place to avoid acclimating too much to one particular location. Mm-hmm. And because of uh, the fact that they're on that they're on the moves, a lot of the elves as asshole stereotypes don't really apply. I'm guessing exactly, exactly. It's more of the elves are what because even even the youngest elves have been around Thea five or six times. Mm-hmm. So it's like when meeting an elf, it's less of they're an asshole, they think they're better than me, and more of this is a wise big brother that has seen a lot more than I could ever see. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to the, when it comes to the gnomes, um, from from what I understand, it there you have it that the gnomes are could be considered out of towners to Thea. Exactly, exactly. They're not from Thea. They weren't there originally. Um, something happened in their version of the Fey realm, and mm-hmm. it started to collapse in on itself. So they just started jumping into portals to escape the collapsing universe. And a lot of them ended up dumped onto Thea, mm-hmm. thus where they met the gnomes and things of this nature. Um, yeah. The gnomes in Thea are very... They're very happy people, uh, you know, just like just like gnomes would be. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that that's the closest representation of just a uh, one of the you know straight from Pathfinder ported into Lands of Thea kind of folks. I don't think I changed much about them. They're just very happy. Um, I like they're very willing to be thrown into their work. I think that was something that Pathfinder did as well. Mm-hmm. Um. In Lands of Thea, they could lean on to their connection with a collapsed plane, and they can get more powerful magic than they could in Pathfinder just simply for being gnomes. But Mm -hmm. other than that, uh, other than that, you know, they're essentially unchanged. Yeah. Now, when it comes to... 
Now, when it comes to half elves, sometimes half elves are tr- are treated are are outcasts. Sometimes they're sometimes sometimes they're le- sometimes they're less so. Um, with half elves on on Thea, be, do they still do they have the same curse that the elves do? Some of them do. When it essentially is, is some half elves are born with the with the curse. Usually, when a half elf is born. The parents will stay in one spot for a while to see if their child starts to acclimate to the environment. If they do, then they'll start to migrate, and then the half elf will be raised by the elves. If they don't, then the parents eventually have to migrate. So more often than not, they'll leave the half elf with their human parent. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes, you meant you mentioned you meant you mentioned the setup that you have with um or with orcs when it comes to ha- when it comes to half orcs um how what's what's the relationship that th- that half orcs tend to have with orcs in thea well so remember when we were talking about dwarves earlier and mm-hmm. i said they have a strong feeling of proving their worth to their societies mm-hmm. um with orcs they have a strong feeling of loyalty and honor to their tribes so with half orcs, essentially, they're born and they instantly have this drive to be the best, to be of use to the other creatures around them. If they're raised around orcs, then they're constantly trying to show the orcs that they can do what the orcs can do. They can be of use as well. If for some reason, you know, if for some reason a half orc is born and he's not as strong as his parents or is not as strong as his peers, then he tries to be like, well, maybe I'm smarter. Maybe I can use magic better. Things of this nature. He always tries to make himself so useful to his tribe. And that the same thing goes with half orcs that are born and stay with human societies. They are constantly like, you know, I come from orcs. I come from an honorable lineage. I need to show the other people around what that lineage means i have to be the best at what i do so there, there's a drive that comes with that whole people that also affects their children as well mm-hmm. so and with um ha- with halflings would that be one of the other ones that um doesn't change much from the from the galarian style of halfling well, halflings in Lance of Thea actually um, have had had it the worst during the Age of Fire, because when all of the peoples were enslaved, they of course were the least useful. So because of that, the they were like given dangerous jobs. They were given jobs that you know the other peop the more like stronger slaves wouldn't be risked doing things of this nature. Because of that, and then after the Age of Fire. Um, when there was talk about, you know, certain lands for certain peoples, they uh, had the unfortunate, they had the unfortunate, uh, luck of being placed their country beside another country, which is essentially the evil country for, Mm -hmm. for all extended purposes. (laughs) So they had to do, they had to deal with that night raids, things of this nature. Um, the halflings in Lands of Thea are actually very stern and no nonsense. They mm-hmm. um, they they come in two types. Either a they're very you know what do you want? Very almost rude uh, when it comes down to how they interact with other people. Um, just we need to get whatever it is done. Whereas the other type of halfling is a type of halfling that kind of grieves for everything that their people has lost. I think there's a picture of one. Mm -hmm. uh, And she worships one of the gods of loss and failure and things of this nature. So Mm -hmm. it's it's either very grim or very serious. Mm -hmm. And when it when it comes to when it comes to humans a lot in a lot of settings humans are kind are kind of the jack, jack of many trades um race is that is that is that still a bit is that still a bit of the case i do see the whole thing of them being of of um alchemically enhanced being one of the heritages that they can have oh yeah (laughs) that's uh that's from the country of persimum essentially what it is is and their 
in their in their country they believe that magic should rule over other things so whenever their children are born they magically experiment on them to make sure that they have strong magical abilities um but humans as a whole in lands of the outside of that one country um in lands of the a lot of things have happened uh there's like a whole history chapter where it talks about um, you know, all of the hardships that the people of Thea have had to struggle through. So because of that, the humans that they are, are actually more battle ready, I would think. Mm-hmm. Um, they have an ability that allows them to have more HP than normal. When they're in their regular societies, they, of course, they, you know, they're very and they do this and that. But almost all of them go through military training to protect their lands just in case you know from the next catastrophe that's about to uh, about to happen so that mm-hmm. that's that i would say that that's the only difference is i gave them more of a focus on being ready to fight mm-hmm. and now when it comes to classes um i am a bit cu- one thing i'm curious about is the kind of obviously trying to go into the nitty gritty of of classes across three different systems would be a bit tricky so yeah. <laughs> instead, instead, I'd like to delve into the class fantasy that that each of these is supposed to um, embody. Of course. And I'll start out with the astrologer. The astrologer class is um, for another class I'll talk about later. We created a random mechanic, and for this partic- for this class in question when certain things happen, they have abilities that are based off of luck, a die roll, things of this nature. Mm -hmm. With the astrologer, we wanted to make a class that was just like that, but we wanted to base it around magic instead of around physical attributes. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we made a zodiac of different symbols of different stars and constellations, and we made it that the astrologer, they get their magical power by rolling that dice every morning and then that's the particular, that's the zodiac or the, the star that is in the sky at any given time. However, mm-hmm. and, and that's where they get their powers from. Or what they can do is instead of rolling the dice, they can just let the constellation just go in order. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it all depends on what they need and how, what, how much they want to risk. Um, mm-hmm. Each of the different, con- I think there are 12 constellations in all. And their their spell lists are small, but they're based off of different aspects of different classes. I think three constellations come from the wizard class, three constellations come from, from cleric, three come from druid, and I think the last three come from, I'm trying to remember at the time, I can't remember if it is bard or paladin, mm-hmm. but essentially it's um, a later... Later on, as they level, of course, they get abilities to control this chaos. But th- that's essentially what they bring to the table is um, is uh, oh, should I put it? I guess chaotic magic that becomes more powerful when it works the way you want it to. Mm-hmm. Um, barrier with what about the barrier sentinel? I always love the barbarian. But mm-hmm. gamers will tell you as well. They wish that there was a tank class in D anD. d or in Pathfinder. That just goes without saying. There are classes that are tougher and harder to kill, but there's no class that says, "Hey, attack me instead of them. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'll I'll take the damage for this guy over here." You know what I'm saying? So that's what the barrier essential is. Sydney essentially is. It's the protector class. Mm-hmm. Um, they get insane HP, insane defenses. We actually just got through a uh, campaign where a friend of mine was playing as a barrier sentinel. And <laughs> I remember after a certain fight, he asked one of his co uh not co-workers, party members, hey, uh, how much damage has you ta- have you taken? And she was like, none. And she was like, none. And he was like, none, huh? How is that possible? <laughs> and then... The other party member said, it's because you always jump in the way whenever she's about to get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And I I can certainly vibe with that, especially since for one of my own projects, um we have we have a cup we have a couple um tr- we have a couple of classes that we have set up that are meant that are meant to be 
One of them is meant to be a pure tanky boy. The other one is meant to be a tanky counterpuncher. So if you have, if you ever played as Dudley in Street Fighter, then you have an idea of what I'm doing. I love Dudley. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Apparently, so, somebody found somebody found this somebody found this weird this weird this weird MMA small time MMA promotion with this one guy who who always shows up in a full on suit and people have been making Dudley memes off of him. <laughs> um, but what about the sensor? The sensor is a class I really like. So the paladin is the champion of good, and the anti paladin is the champion of evil. I wanted to do more with that. So mm -hmm. because in my games I always home homebrewed that paladins could be any type of good. They didn't have to be lawful good. They could be chaotic good or neutral good. So a way of avoiding the that guy problem. Exactly, exactly. And anti paladins by rules is written they have to be chaotic evil, but I didn't like that either. So I made it they could be lawful evil, they could be neutral evil too. Um so in our home games a while ago. I said, it'd be cool if we also had a champion of law and a champion of chaos. So the champion of law is the censor. Um, they're based around a magic caster that they have abilities where they shut down other people's abilities. Not only that, but they have they have spells that, you know, do everything from mind control, protection, um, holding people still, things of this nature. Um, I, I, I hate to reveal myself, to tattle on myself like this, mm -hmm. but Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, the judges. Yep, I was thinking that. Strong inspiration. <laughs> um, especially getting, what especially comes to mind is when I, is the times I would play as um, Judge Gabranth in um, Dissidia, because he had, unlike Compared to a lot of the other characters in the The City of Final Fantasy games, he had a very interesting setup with his with his style. Namely, the fact that he didn't have a normally he didn't have HP attacks. He it would instead it, instead it, but he did have a way to charge up his EX gauge instead, and once he goes into EX mode, the he goes from using the Using a slow, using the slow staff version of his two swords to splitting those in two and getting a lot faster. There you go. Um, and the, in the case of great minds think alike, I'd also use the I'd also use a sensor archetype. Um, but instead of be, instead of being a a paladin of law, the sensor in a project I've been writing called Project Gaia is. A mage is a magic bounty hunter. There you go. There some, yeah, there is a there are with a lot of with a lot of the magic. Magic has its own guild system on Gaia, um, and there is a set of there's a set of laws that it operates under known as the cipher. If you if you end up now if you end up break if this can this this has major and and minor infractions. If you end up breaking one of the bigger ones, like practicing blood magic or necromancy, um, a sensor is sent after you. These are mages that are specifically trained to hunt mages and create weapons that they don't they don't directly attack they don't directly wound somebody, but what they do is directly attack their ability to use magic. See, I think I think you would really like playing as a sensor. They have uh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and reveal it. They have this ability called decree, mm -hmm. and what it is is they could say they could give certain commands and a radius around them. In this radius, you cannot do this action, and if you do, sorry, not you cannot, but it would be unwise to because if you do do this action, not only do you get damaged as soon as you do it, but then the sensor could activate other abilities that cause you to take damage and cause you to not move, cause you to fall asleep, get knocked unconscious, things of this nature because you broke the law in their presence. And has any there there are two references that immediately come to mind with the sensor, even though neither of them are, are strictly using magic. 
One of them is Javert from the from the old play, the old um, yep. the old book and play Les Misérables. Yep, um, exactly. The uh, the other is Judge Dredd. I can see that too. Um, <laughs> As long as you're not seeing the Stallone version, that's not the best representation of Dread. <laughs> but yeah, I can most definitely see that too. Um, um, l- full disclosure, Sensor is actually one of my favorite classes to play. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I, re- I really do like playing as one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I could, I can, cer- I can certainly see, I can certainly see it. Um, if you're going to use any, ju- if you're going to use any, um, film version of Dread to build upon with a sensor. Just stick with the Carl Urban one and you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, but was the was the cultist meant to be kind of a kind of a um e- a evil variant of a cleric? Well actually the cultist so all of these classes started off as hybrid classes ideas. I wanted all of them to be hybrids of two mm-hmm. other classes. And the cultist was the cleric and the ninja, uh, not the ninja, the cleric and the rogue. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, my first drafts were a lot like the Inquisitor. So I wanted something different. I based the rogue powers around magic instead of around something physical. And then Mm -hmm. I came up with the cultist. What they have is they get less domains than a cleric, but they have abilities that allow them to not only disrupt other divine spellcasters, but also they can make their own spellcasting. Um, what's the word? What's the word? Um, hold on. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm trying to remember the word. Addictive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I did a lot of research on real cults in the real world and how they affect uh, followers and things of this nature. So I made it so that the cultist has this ability called enchanting euphoria, where they could place it on their spells, kind of like a meta magic. And when they cast the spell, not only does the person you know have to deal with the regular spell effects, but they have to make an additional will save. If they make an additional, if they fail it, um, they become addicted to the cultist magic, and they want to be around it again. The more the more higher level the cultist you are, the stronger the addiction. So you could literally hit someone with a fireball with enchanting euphoria, and even though it burns them and they're like screaming in pain or whatever, after the fireball is over, they seek you out against their will to try to get hit by another fireball. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to the dragon speaker, I've seen I've seen my fair share of of dragon mage or shaman type type classes over the years. Uh, and given given the given the presence that dragons have in um, Thea, um, what what kind of approach were you trying to go with f- for them? Is it just is it just dragon? Is it a form of dragon magic, or is it a different approach? Well, with the dragon speaker, um, you, I know you're familiar with the dragon shaman class. Mm-hmm. And the dragon speaker is essentially an updated, like it's got. It gets a lot of um, inspiration from that class. But with Thea, what it was, uh, how, what I wanted to do with it is that dragons during the Age of Fire took over all of Thea. And because of that, even though it was a long time ago, a lot of the humanoid races still have a strong distrust of dragons. However, there were some dragons that were good and helped them, help the humanoids break into their freedom. These dragons, their descendants, realize that it's going to be a slow process to get the humanoid races to trust them again. So they created, they um, created relationships with some humanoids, and these humanoids act on their behalf, and they are the dragon speakers, those that mm-hmm. speak for the dragons. In that regard, would they be considered akin to their oracles? Uh. Something like that, more, more like their their emissaries. Mm-hmm. Um, the dragon speaker class can be played in different ways depending on the path of the dragon that you take. Mm-hmm. Um, you uh, there's one the path of the dragon envoy where you could play it uh, almost like a bard. They get like abilities of diplomacy and things of this nature. 
there's the path of the uh of the uh what's it the okay brood, the the brood guard oh oh the kyver so mm-hmm. oh yeah now i remember so the kyver uh devoted are actually the evil dragon speakers they're the ones that served the evil dragons that were that had a grip on Thea and enslaved the other races to begin with, and they're trying to help them gain power so that they can once again take over Thea. Mm-hmm. The last uh, path is the path of the Lost Empress, where there was a particular dragon empress that actually cared for and loved her uh, citizens and created one of the greatest um, nations of Thea before it was shattered from the inside out by civil war. Mm-hmm. Um, there are dragon speakers that, even though, you know, she was a Kyber, there are a lot of people that still, uh, hold her name with honor. So there are dragon speakers that try to follow her philosophies and her example. Mm -hmm. So you could almost play that kind of dragon speaker like a monk almost. So there are different ways you could do the class. Um, I actually had the, um, was writing a dragon speaker for an adventure path, um, just today. And I gotta tell, I, I gotta tell you, it was really fun writing her. I was like, "This is I I feel, I wish I had the opportunity to play a dragon speaker because that'd be cool." Mm-hmm. Now, with I know with the Thean variant of gladiators, I'm curious how similar or different it, it would be because the usual archetype of the gladiator is the is the fight is the showman kind of fighter. <laughs> oh, how 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 would it work? How would it work out with the, with um this variant? The Thean Gladiator is like a hybrid class between the fighter and the bard, whereas they um are like a supportive warrior. They help their teammates, and at the same time, the more they show off and the more they uh, create a show and a spectacle, the more the easier it is for their teammates and their party to find acceptance in any given society that they're in. Not only that, but it also helps the teammates in battle. Uh, They have this ability called rugged renewal, where Mm -hmm. it's like, it's a healing thing that they could use unlimited amount of times, but it's where they deal damage to themselves to heal some kind of condition. So let's say one of their friends is mind controlled. They can literally punch their friend in the jaw. Their friend takes damage but gets another saving throw against the spell. And they're like, oh, whoa. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you're back. Now fight those guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really like the way it's... Uh, what gave me the idea for them, actually, if you uh, play uh, the newest Tekken game, I think it's Tekken 6. Um, uh, no, we're up, to, we're up to 7. And we're going to be up to 8 to in, about a, in a few years' time. Holy shit. <laughs> Uh, I guess it was seven then. You're right. Um, there's a downloadable content character for Julia Chang. And mm. she has become a YouTuber. And when I saw her that she was a YouTuber, when I used her the first time, I was like, it'd be really cool if there was a class that had like some kind of sensor, like some kind of machine that allowed other people to see it so that they could have gladiatorial fights in any like anywhere. So it didn't have to be in an arena and they could have like the che- they could hear the cheers from the crowd and things like that from the machine and thus it would like boost up and rally their allies and themselves and thus it hit me that I wanted to make this class. Mm-hmm. Now with hopefully hopefully no hopefully nobody does the are you not entertained gag while playing as a gladiator. I actually I actually want to see that. <laughs> yeah. Now with the Marshall um what immediately comes to mind is of course the Marshall that was in third edition as well as the um the war the warlord that was that was in fourth and the I would I would bring up the battle mind, but it was but that but the battle mind was a disappointment. There has yeah. been I know some people say that the battle mind is is the is the successor to the warlord. It isn't. <laughs> it is. Some you some may argue that, but it is a free country, and you are free to be wrong. <laughs> uh, 
But is the marshal meant to meant to be that kind of lead that kind of lead from the front approach? Exactly. The marshal is supposed to be a general in battle. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of abilities that help that will like move their allies, bolster their allies' uh, offenses, defenses, give them damage reduction. Well, at the same time, my favorite ability of the marshal is one called battle plan. Um, it's kind of like it's almost like a bardic performance, but it focuses on giving uh, them the them and, and their allies more of a chance to hit a critical threat or a critical hit, things of this nature. They'll be like, oh, you know, attack it from the back or something like that. And as long as the marshal speaks, all of their allies have an easier time hitting the weak spots of their enemies. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to the mercenary, um, it would be ve- a lot of people would as- it would be very easy to assume that a mercenary is not that removed from a fighter. Um, how how do you how do you establish the mercenary identity so that it becomes its own class instead of just being a fighter offshoot? The mercenary actually was a really fun class for me to make because I just, I don't know, it, I don't know how it came to me, but I was like, I love multi-classing. I really do. I love getting a whole bunch of different abilities from different classes and putting them into one character. So for the mercenary, I thought it would be cool to have a class that has just general, you know, the ability to fight, um, the ability to take hits, you know, just general abilities. But then they have um, like trees almost, like uh, careers that they Mm -hmm. can grow and then they can gain the abilities of other classes. So it's like a warrior that you customize. Um, The original mercenary had like this gold pool where if they had a certain amount of gold pieces, their abilities would increase. Or if they were getting paid a certain amount of gold pieces, their ability would increase. But after talking to my publisher, we realized that that could easily be abused. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially if you've got a Monty Hall GM. Exactly, exactly. So what we did was we changed it where it's a strong focus on the trees that you have and what um, like what they could do for any, indiv- like any individual mercenary. Um, they have this ability called Determination. It's very similar to, I don't know if you're familiar with this one he class the war priest but they get an ability where they could heal themselves as a swift action Mm -hmm. um the they the determination ability is like that but as you level up you get another ability called true ally where the mercenary has opened up with certain party members so whenever you use um whenever you use determination the mercenary's determination also inspires the people that have become your true allies and they get healed as a swift action as well. So I really do like the class. It's very customizable. I think that it stays useful throughout the game, the, you know, from level one to level 20. Um, I've had a few people play it and they really like it. Mm-hmm. So um, ne- next would be the necromancer. Not to be confused with the Necromancer. Uh, the Necromancer is a is a cool class. Um, in 3.5, there was a class called the Dread Necromancer. Mm-hmm. And that class was awesome. Uh, eventually, you it makes you like the master of necromancy spells and abilities. And eventually, the class turns you into the actual monster, a lich. Um, it mm-hmm. was a really cool class. I don't know if it was overpowered or what, but... Um, they really didn't bring it back. Um, the Necromancer and Lands of Thea is very strongly based off of this, but I took it a step further mm-hmm. where the original class um, has that you could become a Lich, but there are also customizations in Lands of Thea. Um, there's one that lets you become a mummy. There's one that lets you become a vampire eventually. It changes the uh, the whole feeling of the class too, like the, like the flavor um, and the abilities are cool too. I I really like it. It's um, like you could play a necromancer as a cleric. Of course, you could play a necromancer as a wizard. But I liked how 
this necromancer takes like it's just a focus on just that there's not anything else like if you want to be a necromancer i really think you'll like this one mm-hmm. uh, now with the noble having noble as a class is one is one of those things that some people have pushed back on me about where they where yeah. they think that noble should be a background and not and not a class on its own I yeah. I don't I don't quite agree because because I think when you try and make them a background, then the impact that they that the that they can have because there's because you're dealing with something that's going to be a big damn deal for that for that character throughout, and just having it as a background is not going to have as much of an impact. So I I agree. Is so so. What can you tell me about the fantasy that the Thean version of a of the noble class, pun not intended, well, is? <laughs> in, in Thea, like I said, with the human uh, people earlier, there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of things that could happen just out of the blue. So in Thea, they know that if the people, the citizens don't think they're being led by a strong leader that can lead to revolt, that can lead to dissension, that can lead to scattering, uh, you know, refugee ranks, things of this nature. So they have, they know that they have to be strong and they have to put up a unified front to their citizens if they want to continue to be nobles. Mm -hmm. Thus, so in Thea, nobles actually adventure. They actually go like when they're, when they're young and capable, they go out into the world and collect a, bunch of different achievements and things of this nature so that when they come back and when they're done adventuring maybe like i don't know their 30s or 40s they can be like hey that's king john he fought a hydra over there by the bar things of this nature Mm -hmm. so they know you know so to renew their people's faith in them yeah Um, um it definitely i get flashbacks to the idea of the questing knight or the hedge, or the hedge knight in um, Game of Thrones. Exactly, exactly, same concept. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like the noble class. That's mm-hmm. another, just like the censor. It's another one of my babies. Mm-hmm. Um, they have these abilities called leadership styles. And with the leadership styles, you could play different kind of nobles. There's one that lets you play a merchant, uh, like a noble that has their riches from selling things, a merchant king, a prince or princess. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one that lets you play a warlord where like you're like the leader of like a very powerful tribe that might makes right and things of this nature. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one that's based off lineage where you you just um you were born into it. Your family was king, things of this nature. You have servants and things of this nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there, there's two more. It's it's really, I think it's really cool. It's a it's a take on the noble class that doesn't make it boring. That I feel like that was a problem with noble classes of the past. They just didn't seem, they didn't seem like you were really contributing to the group of adventurers. So mm-hmm. the the way I did, uh, the way we did it, really, me and my publisher was we made it so that these are adventuring nobles like they can handle the court they can handle uh, you know galas and parties but at the same time if an assassin breaks through the window ready to kill them they're like oh well i'm level 13 and they pull out a blade themselves and they handle it you know what i mean Mm -hmm. now the shizu the shizukari um I feel if would it be correct of me to say that this that it is intended to be your inter, your um your attempt to do your own version of it, of the samurai that isn't just a um isn't just a kit bash with that class actually the Shizukari isn't one of mine it's actually brought to me by my publisher he mm-hmm. said I really like what you're doing with this I want to I want to show you this class. It's it was a hybrid between barbarian and uh monk and it's really cool. Uh he said, "How would you put this into Thea?" And then we just worked together on it. Um essentially that one kingdom I told you earlier that there was a dragon empress um but later on the kingdom kind of shattered. They mm-hmm. had a very strong uh they had a very strong dedication of the citizens. All the citizens were ra- uh, like 
trained in combat, things of this nature. And that dragon empress actually was known for taking in a lot of orcs that had been displaced during mm -hmm. another event. So when the orcs came to uh, her kingdom, they also, they're, they're about loyalty, they're about honor, they also wanted to be involved, they wanted to help with that. So when the orcs got with the monks and they created something like a type of fighting that created the Shizukari or the quiet anger, where it's, a combina where it's like the fury of a barbarian, but controlled with calmness and patience. Um, the class is really cool. I like how you can do a whole bunch of like monk tricks, like jumping up on walls, things of this nature. You can do all that, but you could do all that while in rage and you can get rage powers as Kai powers, Kai powers as rage powers is really fun to play. I, I, I played it once and it was awesome. Mm -hmm. The way, the way you, the way you mentioned Kai and the way you pronounce Kai, the, what instantly came to mind is the is is a certain race in the space too that can be best described as samurai chickens or samurai ostriches actually. <laughs> uh, that sounds funny. <laughs> yeah, the end the the endless games, both endless space one and two, and endless legend are. Make make for make for interesting ideas, especially stuff like the Vaulters, who are humans that have that have significantly advanced technology for a fantasy setting. Oh, now with the thaumaturgist, what instantly comes to mind with thaumaturgy is that it is that it's meant to be the study of miracles. But a lot of a lot of times when thaumaturgy shows up in games, they tend to be some offshoot of uh, wizardry. Um, what appro what approach and what sort of fantasy did you want to go with the thaumaturgist? This particular class um, was something that was a long. It, it was something that I worked on for a while because I can remember being like young and getting this idea, where. Um, I wanted to take the class, the, what was it called? It's like a class, it was a prestige class you could take when you took levels of wizard and levels of cleric, Mystic Thurge. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take the Mystic Thur Thurge and turn it into one class. And it took me a while to master it, but essentially what the Thaumaturgist is, is it's a spellcaster that has discovered a new type of magic called origin magic which is the font where all magic flows, both divine mm -hmm. and arcane. Mm -hmm. because, of the, because of this, they're able to master its energy and they can, ca they can cast both arcane and divine magic, though it's limited. Not only that, but they could also combo their magic and create like spell, what's, what's the class calls spell chains, where the more spells they cast in succession, the more powerful the chain becomes, and then it deals more damage on its own. It's like a vortex of magical energy is spinning around there themselves. Mm -hmm. I um, I get flashbacks to a red mage. So um, I don't not in very, not in terms of appearance, but in terms of being able to um, f being able to being able to freewheel between two styles of magic. Yes, yes. You know what? I, I will go ahead and say that that, that connects it to something. I'm going to be honest with you. I got the name. Uh, originally, the class was called the Thaumaturge, and I got the name from finding out that the word Thaumaturge means to take two things that are opposite and make them work together. And I mm -hmm. thought to myself, oh, Arcane and Divine. This is the perfect class name. And then Pathfinder 2E came out with the class they called the Thaumaturge, and I was gritting my teeth. I was like, okay, <laughs> well, they're more famous than me, so I have to change the name of mine. So I changed it to the Thaumaturgist. Yeah. Now, you had mentioned earlier about, about the Zealot. Um, what sort of what sort of caster would the would the would you say the Zealot is? Uh it's a oh, let me try to think. It's a divine caster. Mm -hmm. Um the zealot is just like with the censor being the champion of law the zealot is the champion of chaos it started off being a fusion between the barbarian class and the paladin class and essentially what it was was 
when they go into their version of rage, which is called uh, what's it? vehemence, that's what it's called. Mm-hmm. Essentially, random effects would happen. They roll a dice, and then that would determine the power up they got when they were in vehemence. Um, these can be essentially, you know, elemental damage to their weapons. It could be stronger strength, stronger charisma, because their spell casting is based on charisma. So they can be like they can go into vehemence and become a better spellcaster. Go into vehemence, be a just stronger warrior. Uh, and the more the more you level up as um, zealot, the more things get added to your vehemence. I think in the end, it's like you roll a d12, and there are 12 mm-hmm. different effects that can happen. Um, but you gain more and more control over it. Like if you roll a 6 um, and you're a certain level, you could either add 3 or minus 3 from the 6 result and get anywhere between 3 and 9. Mm-hmm. Um, it's... Uh, um, we also gave it abilities where um, we also give it abilities where it can um, just like spread chaos in other ways, like with rumors in a um, intrigue setting, or it could also uh, what else? It could. Um, I'm trying to remember, but it, I'm drawing blanks. Essentially. <laughs> um, what it's comes a, to mind is a fi- what comes to mind is a firebrand. Yes, exactly. And the thing is, even the player themselves don't know how they're going to enter combat. They enter combat and they say, uh, you know, like you know, I think this is a combat. I'll use a, I'll use one of my some of my vehemence rounds. Mm-hmm. They'll roll the dice and they'll be like, okay, I guess I'm a really badass spellcaster right now, and then start slinging spells for free that deal more damage and things of this nature. Their spell list. Um, has a lot to do with the Maga spell list, where there are spells that just deal straight damage, but there are also spells that cause chaos, like mm-hmm. black tentacles, um, mirror images, things like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, now there was there was one there was one thing in the world of Thea that that grabbed my attention, and I wanted I knew I wanted to cover it, but talk to me about sky racing. <laughs> uh yes um there was one campaign and this was when i was a teenager we had just got the video game uh i'm trying to remember the name sonic free riders <laughs> <laughs> that game was boss and i remember playing it and talking to my little brother and i was like yo can you imagine this but like with dragons instead and he was like, yo, that'd be really cool. I'd be like, I'm going to make something for the D&D game. Hold on. And that's, I created Sky Racing, which is essentially, there are tournaments where people ride flying magical beasts, whether they be uh, Pegasi, dragons, wyverns. And during the race, there are obstacles and things of this nature. Um, I just, I, I, I really love it. I have an entire adventure based fully on sky racing actually a sky racing tournament and believe it or not that is the adventure that we plan to work on right after we're done with um the stone hewn legacy it's called rebel sky and i can't wait to get started on that one yeah um what's fun the uh, looking at looking at it from from my from my own perspective ends up creating some amusing ideas because um i I I have been in the last few years. I have been re, I have been rekindling my interest in uh, in form in Formula One as well mm-hmm. as well as as well as rally, um, especially mm-hmm. when I learned about the beauty and terror that was Rally Group B in the in the nineteen eighties. <laughs> the idea with Group B, which what well, first off we're dealing with rally, so a whole lot of dirt racing. But the idea yeah. with Group B was a was meant to be a side meant to be a side version of the of the World Rally Championship that was meant that was meant to allow people who might get who, who manufacturers who might get priced out or didn't meet the qualifications of Group A to to try things out. But here here is where the dangerous part comes in. Ver- almost no almost no restrictions. 
One of the core restrictions was that you, was that for that mo- for a certain model of car you had to have manufactured a smaller amount. We're talking like two thousand. Oh, beyond be, but beyond that, when it came to when it came to en- when it came to engine size and the like, as long as it runs, it works. So what you would end up having is these super and turbocharged engines in cars that were half the weight. Oh my god. <laughs> and it it could get real bad especially in some especially in some places in Europe where where nobody had seen these kind of vehicles and they didn't know how to get out of the fucking way. <laughs> um, oh man. There would be there would be You'd have people in the crowds trying to reach out and t- trying to reach out and touch the vehicle, and they come up, they come back out of it without fingers. Um, <laughs> there's hor- there's all sorts of horror stories in in that because, well, you're go- you're cute cute in mind. You're going it. You're going with this the kind the kind of engine that the kind of engine that you would normally see in a in a full on mu- in a full on muscle car, but. You can get away with that in a muscle car because those things are going to be heavy to to account for the fact that you've got a souped up engine. Yeah. So imagine putting that same imagine putting that same muscle car engine in, say, in, in, in say um say some not not a mini but but not much bigger than a mini. And he you said, get. Hmm? He said, "I he said I believe I can fly." <laughs> It did. It unfortunately did happen. The, but, but through through that, and especially seeing um, the way Formula One works, it yeah. wouldn't it wouldn't be too hard to do it to do a. I don't think it would be too hard to do a sky a sky racing campaign that deals with, um, the tra- deals with the party being me- being members of a sky of a sky racing team. That's um, literally. Hold on, hold on. Now you, you're, you're giving them spoilers because that's what happens. <laughs> yeah, but oh, oh, go ahead. I will. I will admit that with some of that, I'm cribbing notes from the Drive to Survive series on Netflix, which is actually pretty good. Uh, I'm gonna have to check that out. Drive to Survive. You said it was called. Yeah. Um. It ended up it end, it ended up making a a um, back marker team like Haas into a bit of an underdog story. Okay, I like I literally you know what I'm glad you're bringing up like things like uh, the rallies and the races and things of that nature because I actually did a lot of research on those races um, to write Rebel Sky. Mm-hmm. There's one chapter where they the characters need um, the P, the PCs they need information, mm-hmm. but they can't get it legally, so they have to go to the black market. And when they go down there, the black market's having an illegal sky race, and mm-hmm. essentially they're like, if you want the information, you have to win this illegal sky race. So yeah. I would did I did research on all of that on underground races, things of this nature. It's I I I'm really looking forward to writing that adventure. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> You prob you probably dipped into the concept. You probably ended up familiarizing yourself with toge racing at some point. With that, I'm guessing. Yep, and not only that, uh, uh, not only that, but I have a, uh, I, I've had many jobs, mm-hmm. all of them legal, all of them legal, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was working at a particular factory, I had spoken to a gentleman, and he said. That he had he used to illegally street race, and as soon as he said that, I pulled out a notepad and was like, "Tell me everything." <laughs> <laughs> but like, th- this is information I can't normally get, bro. I need it. Of course, if of course, if you want to dial up the craze, you could always look up a anime film called Redline. Redline. I'm gonna check that out too. Because red um. Redline took took like six years to make because because of because of how many frames they had to animate. Dang. Oh. It might it might have been it might have been less. The point is it took a lot of it took a lot of time and there were a lot of animation frames. And it gets crazy. <laughs> but I... 
Although, it, although I have, I have to, I have to qualify. I have to, I had to qualify it with anime film because there was a live action film called Red Line that has nothing to do with it. Oh, no, just to just to avoid confusion, for the same reason why um, the the first Avengers movie in the UK when it was moved over to the UK, it had to be it had to be retitled Avengers Assembled to avoid confusion with the with the spy series from the from the seventies. Oh, I see. Oh. I'm definitely going to have to check that out, Red Line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But one thing I'm curious about is when it comes to Sky Races, I'd imagine it was a bit of a challenge to keep the fantasy of, of, a, of a race while everyone's rolling dice. How, how, did you, how did you approach that? Well, what I did is, um, are you familiar with uh, Pathfinder... Um, Pathfinder 1E's chase mechanics. Yeah. I heavily leaned on that where essentially you have to roll a dice to get past a certain obstacle, but mm-hmm. then your your character moves a certain amount of spaces, and when they reach a certain space, then another event happens. And all yeah. of the events are based on racing. Like, take for example, during Sky Races, there could be... Uh, an updraft that gives your 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 um, creature more speed, mm-hmm. so you have to go ahead and lean into that. It's uh, the the chase mechanics really helped me when I was working on sky racing mechanics mm-hmm. because the trick with that I think is to keep the players immersed by constantly having things happen. If you're just like, oh, roll the dice, oh, you move five spaces, you're in the lead. It's like that's that's not as fun as oh let's see roll you know oh no there's like let's say you're sky racing and it's like oh no there's a a cart of cabbages in the way (laughs) my cabbages (laughs) exactly you have to avoid them quick make Mm -hmm. a handle animal check to make your dragon move to either side yeah it's like that um i think that keeping things happening keeps Mm -hmm. people immersed yeah Plus, if you're just if you're just rolling to advance, you can't you can't um you can't properly represent things like dirty drivers. Even in even in legal even in legal races, there are all, there's always that there's always that one guy who a lot of people hate because he doesn't race clean. Um, in NASCAR, one one big example is a lot a lot of people really hated um, and arguably still do Joey Logano. Mm. Because because of the fact that he would, even though he even though he won quite a lot, he would he would win dirty. Like he's the guy who he's the kind of guy who even if even if it doesn't matter, he'd still beat and bang with you just to try and get ahead of you. And then and then, but not even not even own up to the fact that he's beat that he's racing dirty like that because Earnhardt would do Earnhardt would do that would do that a lot, but he would just not give a shit. Logano likes to pretend that he's the nice guy while while still racing everybody dirty, and that pisses everybody off. Dang. I'm, I'm 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 vastly simplifying the matter, but but I'd I'd imagine when you get when when things are on the line like that, there's going to be some people who will race who will race clean for the crowds, and some people who don't who don't mind accidenting somebody. Exactly, exactly. There's you know. In the first chapter of Rebel Sky, the players aren't racers. They're like, they're essentially hired as security during the race. Mm-hmm. But then one team cheats and, uh, f- like, horribly injures some of the other racers on a particular team, and they'll mm-hmm. be disqualified unless they find new racers. So mm-hmm. that's where the players come in. Yeah, I I can get, I can get that and. Of course, of course. Sometimes there's the low cows in races, like what happened with um, Nikita Mazepin a, a couple of years ago, where for one, he kept finding new and interesting ways to spin out in his own races, giving him the nickname Mazespin. And two, he managed to piss off other other drivers because he because he didn't understand the concept of blue flags. Um, in F one, if you if you're getting blue flagged, it basically means. Somebody, somebody ahead in the standings is lapping you. Get out of the way. 
Yeah. And he he wouldn't, then it would annoy everybody. <laughs> it, it's it's uh, it was a rare it's it's it was an amusing case of of unity. Everyone everyone was united by hate by hating on Mazepin. <laughs> uh, but what would you say have been some of the some of the lessons that you've learned in developing um, lands of Th- lands of Thea? over the time that you've done so? Um, Honestly, I really did. Um, My publisher taught me that the little details matter. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the the world chapters, like where it talks about the countries. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I was first writing, um, you know, the country descriptions, he would always ask me another question. And I would always have to think about it and make the world and made the world more uh, interesting as a result. Like I remember when I first I gave him the description of Avemore, the country of Avemore, and he was like, so what kind of food do they eat? And I was like, hold on. So then I looked at their imports and exports. Like I looked at the geography where they were near and they were like, okay, so they eat these things. And he was like, oh, what do they sell out of these ports? And I was like, oh, well, and then I looked at the food they ate and what, like, the little, the little details, um, I've become a lot better at uh, just making them up as I go along. And I feel like that helps my writing a lot. And, um, like, I'm noticing that I'm doing that in my adventure paths. Um, Of course, anyone could say, oh, you entered a cave and there was a guy in there. But I put details in the way the cave looks. I put details in the areas uh, to exit and enter the cave. I put uh, details in the enemy. Like when I'm writing the enemy's stats, I make things that are realistic. Now I put tactics blocks with the monsters. Like this monster usually does this, but if this happens, he does this. You know, things of this nature. Just I've really grown to appreciate... um, appreciate my world and i make it more i make it more uh give it a stronger ability to suck readers in when i put those little details in there mm-hmm. and i i will certainly look forward to seeing how how the how the project overall develops with time thanks but with all that said i would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and going in detail with me throughout lands of Thea and the madness that, ent- that entails there's a lot more that I could that I could have asked but um <laughs> obviously obviously we all have our limits but anytime you see fit to return whether it's to further discuss lands of Thea or to or to la- or to laugh or to ask what the hell was what the hell was Paizo smoking when they came with the cavalier class <laughs> the door is always open as I often say around here, Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay! Fucking frosty, everybody!